you can create wealth unlike uh you know like people think it's like the laws of thermodynamics if i am to gain someone has to lose if if i if my share of the pie gets bigger i have to take someone else's uh piece of the pie that's not true that, that that's true of like energy conservation and like physics right like that you can't create energy or, or destroy it but you can create wealth Welcome to the Edge Podcast. I'm DeFi Dad from Fourth Revolution Capital, and I'm joined here by my co-host and colleague from 4RC, Adam, aka Nomadic. Adam, how's it going? It's going good, man. Uh, super excited to talk to Sam today. I think he's been uh, my favorite podcast guest of the last couple weeks on some great shows. So can't wait to just explore some of those topics a little deeper and just learn more about Sam and Frax. Okay, so let's kick things off then. Today, we're talking extensively about Frax Finance. Frax is the first fractional algorithmic stablecoin. It's known for having introduced the world to the concept of a stablecoin partially backed by collateral and partially stabilized algorithmically. Frax has been one of the few to scale a decentralized stablecoin to over 1 billion in circulating supply. Sam Kazimian is the founder of Frax Finance. Interestingly, Sam also co-founded IQ.Wiki, formerly Everopedia, which is the largest crypto encyclopedia. Sam founded Frax in June 2019 and launched the Frax stablecoin in December 2020. Since then, Frax has unleashed a series of DeFi products, which seem to only strengthen the adoption of Frax, the stablecoin, including Frax Swap, Frax Lend, the ETH PEG stablecoin, FRX ETH, the voting escrow token, VFXS, and then the Frax price index, which very cleverly keeps its price constant according to the price of all items within the CPI basket. So on that note, Sam, this is an interview that is very long overdue. It is such a pleasure to finally get to speak with you. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, this is going to be fun. I have gotten to watch you from afar uh, with Frax since 2020, and that was a very sort of noisy time in the history of DeFi. And it's just remarkable, all the products that you've launched since then. But I, I think the story that we'll tell here today is that all of these products seem to very naturally emanate from uh, a standpoint of further supporting and building uh, the market for the stable coins that are created by Frax, one of those actually being called Frax. Why don't we just get started then with some background, how you got to be working today on Frax and I guess all the other things you've accomplished here working with crypto assets. So I, I came to the U.S. when I was uh, pretty young, around six. Um, I did most of my public school education, like anyone in the in America, in, in SoCal. And then I went to UCLA uh, in Southern California. I double majored in philosophy and neuroscience. So totally unrelated. I self-taught myself programming and stuff. And while I was uh, at UCLA, I uh, learned about crypto, um, got into the kind of early... Uh, proof of work, the script mining stuff, and the tail end of like SHA-256 mining before the first ASICs came out and stuff. Uh, this was like 2013 and 14. Um, I, I got into crypto since then, and it was just something really, really cool that uh, it was basically my main hobby. I, I'd just been studying neuro and philosophy. I wanted to probably go into uh, medicine or, or like postgraduate work and stuff like that. Um, then, like like you said, I founded uh, Everpedia, which now is IQ Wiki. It's a crypto uh, encyclopedia that uses like a token staking model to edit and things like that. And it's actually uh, done really well. It's uh, the the team's rebuilt uh, it using uh, EVM tech, so all the contracts are now actually on uh, Polygon and Ethereum mainnet. So it's actually very very cool. Um, if, if you like the kind of new, you know, social media Web3 stuff, uh, it's kind of like the Wikipedia of, of Web3, kind of like how Lens Protocol is kind of like the Twitter or YouTube of, of uh, Web3. Uh, it's just called IQ.Wiki. But the interesting thing uh, is that, you know, my own worldview about finance and crypto continued to evolve since like 2013. I consistently uh, started having the belief that crypto is like an amazing asset class and technology, but it's not a good currency um even from back when i learned about bitcoin in like uh 2014 ish 13 uh and like i started thinking like oh this is gonna you know back then people were like you're gonna buy your coffee with bitcoin right like like you're gonna go and uh spend it here and there and i think there's just been a collective consciousness of the industry that 
has evolved in these is these views. I think more people will probably say today, uh, you're going to buy your coffee with you know USDC, Frax, Dai, you know, and then stuff like that, uh, rather than with Bitcoin or Ether. You're going to invest in Bitcoin and Ether, and you're you know hopefully going to you know do really well and 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 things like that. But the the collective consciousness of volatile uh, currency uh, is is not really in in vogue anymore. It was huge in like 2014, 15, 16. And so as my own view um, kind of started, you know, taking shape, um, I used to joke that I was kind of the first uh, stablecoin maximalist. And it, and what I meant by that is like all of the, you know, projects that try to be a currency. In fact, the word cryptocurrency, the industry itself, I, I, I just kept getting this feeling that it's kind of a, a misnomer of sorts. Um, this doesn't take away from the the industry or the potential. I think crypto is probably the the most important thing to to happen since the internet itself. I, I genuinely do believe that. It's just the volatile assets are not currencies, and so it's, it's it was always funny to me as a as this belief in me formed that you know the whole industry is called cryptocurrency, but there's only a few stable coins, but all of them are volatile assets, and and it's called cryptocurrency. Now it's called crypto or you know Web three or, or all this stuff. So so it's a little bit better. Um, but fast forward to 2019, when I started getting the ideas of, of Frax, the, the idea back then was like, there was different types of stable coins. Um, DAI was very nascent. It was actually pretty hard to understand back then because, you know, there was no such thing as people saying DeFi or, or like all of this stuff. It had, Maker had just kind of launched uh, the the sigh and and die and, and these kinds of things. I remember there was the purple paper that was very uh, difficult to understand for a lot of people because it was so new and, and like revolutionary. Um, and then there was this uh, there's basis right the the first kind of idea of like the algorithmic kind of stable coin uh, thing, which was just a white paper that raised a bunch of money in in the you know the run up of the 2018-19 kind of uh, ICO craze. And so it's in that kind of atmosphere, right, that um, I I started thinking about how to build Frax or just kind of a unique take on stable coins. And the idea with Frax was, was pretty simple. It was like you had these algorithmic, like basically no collateral stable coins. And uh, you had stuff like Tether, fiat coins, and you had the advent of over collateralized uh, stable coins. And we just thought, well, um, what's in the middle? What, what what looks like fractional reserve banking uh, in in the middle here? And that's how we build Frax is like partially uh, hard assets like other stable coins, uh, other safe assets, over collateralized loans, right? Through like Frax Lend or, or other infrastructure and stuff. Um, and then the other half was uh, volatile assets, right? I like FXS, like Ethereum and, and stuff just held in, in like the treasury. Now, one thing we could talk about that's kind of interesting is my view has evolved. Frax for the 2023 roadmap is going to be 100% collateral of exogenous assets entirely. And um, by exogenous, I actually mean uh, not even really volatile or even, uh, you know, on-chain assets entirely. I mean, the closest thing possible to risk-free assets. And we can, you know, kind of talk about what that means and in terms of getting as close to the, the the Fed to be the only counterparty of of like a stablecoin issuer, I think that that's going to be ultimately the closest token on chain to the the risk free kind of uh, you know people might call it a a like private quasi CBDC. I just think it's it's a good stablecoin. <laughs> that's what the the best stablecoin will end up being. So definitely talk about that. But back to kind of en- ending this view uh, and and kind of coming to the general the current year of 2023 the reason i continue to be reinforced in this view of stablecoin maximalism that i kind of refer to is that i think a lot of stuff is just converging on the same kind of like economic or or defi worldview whether they they call it something or they they name it or brand it or market it in, in like a different way everyone's discovering the same truth uh, convergently in, you know, through their own path, but then they're kind of getting to the same place over time, right? It's uh, kind of similar to how Leibniz and Newton both discovered calculus, right? They discovered how to do integrals and differential equations, but they never 
uh, you know, talk to each other about it, right? They, they never were actually like operating or things like that. So I think that's kind of what's going on with uh, stablecoin and DeFi uh, industry, right? It's like, except there's more cooperation, but everyone's coming through in terms of their own uh, view. And so um, that's, that's what's basically going to take us, I think, through 2023. Sam, that that's awesome. You you said a lot of things that I want to kind of circle back to. One of them being, I think we should get more into the Fed stuff maybe a little bit later. Uh, the 2023 roadmap for Frax, I definitely want to dive into a bit more. Um, but just kind of taking it back a step further, or f- just kind of for our listeners, can you just briefly describe like what the Frax suite of products look like today? And, and maybe this term, DeFi Trinity, if you could also just... Uh, Kind of define that what that means to you. I, I believe that's something that you've coined. Yeah, um, and it's cool that that's uh, kind of gotten a, a like life of its own too in in DeFi. So um, we call them uh, sub protocols. And so what uh, people are asking, you know, what does Frax do? What does the DAO do and stuff? And uh, the the kind of one liner is that we build the best and most innovative stable coins and we build kind of these sub protocols that are infrastructure for them like frax lend frax swap uh frax ferry and some stealth stuff that we're working on and the idea behind this is we're not like trying to be a DeFi suite we're not trying to kind of be um some kind of you know group of like developers that just builds anything and you know tries to get some kind of uh you know traction with them or tvl or something we have a very very narrow and a very specific scope which is to get our stable coins as uh the thing that's extremely important in the industry like issue the best and most innovative stable coins and allow them to prosper by having these sub protocols that you can you know, take out loans and do uh native issuance on cross chain so you can mint redeem them that's the frax ferry system for example uh frax swap which has twams and uh, other stuff coming and, and all of these things are totally uh new we, we coat them from the ground up they're not like you know uh you know like like fork this and then you know just brand it as, as frax they're entirely made for a specific purpose um, so we basically have stable coins and we have sub protocols, right? That, that, uh, are supposed to support the Frax stable coin ecosystem. They're not, uh, you know, they're not competitors or something of like Aave or, or like Uniswap or something, or like Frax Ferry is not a general token bridge. It's actually just for, um, moving native issuance of, of Frax stable coins across different chains. Um, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, opened up for like just bridge any token or something. It's not a competitor to stuff like multi-chain or Axelar, um, you know, Synapse and, and things like that. So it's a very specific uh, vision. And, and everything we do is like for a very, very specific reason. And so far, um, as you guys might have noticed, it, it's very synergistic and, and it's working pretty well because then the, everything we build kind of builds on top and nothing is kind of out of left field, right? Like we're not building a like nft marketplace or like you know working on uh an, an nft art set or some kind of this or that and, and stuff and that's all great but it's is not our our area of a expertise it's not part of our uh vision our vision is multi-trillion dollar stable coin issuance and usage in in the next five five to ten years um for the the frax stable coins right and so actually one thing to also add is our KPI for, you know, how well things are doing, um, even though we have things that are kind of similar to every kind of DeFi thing, what's TVL or what's, you know, fees, revenue or stuff like that, um, we have stablecoin KPIs, like what is the spot demand for uh, our, the, the Frax dollar peg stablecoin or like how many people are using FPI, uh, the CPI peg stablecoin to actually save, like what, how many of, of that is, is being held idle in wallets or what DAOs hold it and, and things like that. And um, where is Frax Ether being used uh, instead of like an ETH parent in AMM? Like that that's still very new. So like we can also just talk about like the the WEATH kind of uh, replacement program incentives and stuff, the, the, the way that we see uh, Frax Ether functioning in, in the medium to long term. But we have totally different KPIs. We, we operate in kind of like the stable coin mindset just totally different. Um, I think we might be the only team, but more and more people and projects and, and DAOs are issuing their own stable coins, uh, which again is kind of this this view that 
we're all kind of converging on these kinds of primitives that are lending liquidity and stable coins, which is what I started calling kind of the, the DeFi trinity, they're going to have to have KPIs similar to us because the the way that you actually, you know, successfully uh, grow a stable coin is with stable coin KPI spot demand, how much of your stable coin is being used as uh, both as a unit of account debt denomination, as well as uh, medium of exchange, right? When, when you hold a stable coin in your wallet and don't expect an interest rate paid to you, you are just using it as cash, as currency, as digital medium of exchange. You are not expecting an interest rate, right? And so that's the, the way to think about organic uh, stablecoin traction. And so we, we look at all of these things. When you consider that other protocols that started with, uh, you know, an AMM or like a, a lending, borrowing, money market, the fact that they're now looking at or have committed to creating a stable coin, is that just like a different path that they're taking? Like they started in one in one place, you started in another, and and now you're both sort of filling in the gap in that DeFi trinity? Uh, or have you thought about, is there like an inherent advantage to where you are, to where Frax is, having started with the stable coin and now having like, created obviously these other products that are lending and liquidity related? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So uh, this is actually kind of a, a good time to describe what my view of like stablecoin maximalism actually is. And so a lot of people, because of like the the maximalism, they think, oh, this might be like something toxic or, or like whatever, right? Um, actually, I think stablecoin maximalism is probably one of the most positive sum and like cooperative maximalist views there is in terms of I, I think that stable coins are the best way to monetize something, uh, the best instead of like like fees, right? Like instead of protocol fees or whatever, um, they're the best way to um, get long-term sticky demand for your protocol. Uh, people using your thing, your liability as currency as a unit of account is probably the strongest network effect out of all possible network effects that we could talk about, whether it's like social media network effect, brand network effect, affiliation stuff. Uh, monetary network effect is the most powerful network effect you can look around for as in terms of the US dollar, right? And in, in the traditional uh, world economy and the financial space, right? And so the stablecoin maximalist view in short is like everything in crypto in terms of currency in terms of payments in terms of monetization of of like products will tend towards being stable coins people will use stable coins as money people will use stable coins as mediums of exchange protocols that are trying to make the, the maximize their their value creation will issue the most relevant stable coins to them uh for example lido for in, in the long term will might think about rethinking Steeth as as an ETH stablecoin. What that would mean, I, I don't know. So I'm not I'm not saying like I know what they're doing or, or whatever. They I have no idea. Um although I've like heard stuff on Twitter that they're like, oh, uh which could just be community people. But the idea is like if you issue something and and build it like a stable coin, it's the most profitable, it's the most useful, uh it's the most uh way to actually get um value for your, you know, governance token holders protocol or, or whatever. So that's the kind of stablecoin maximalist view and that everything will kind of converge to stablecoins in one way or another. Everything will kind of converge. Uh, and that doesn't mean, so like uh, the reason I think stablecoin maximalism is such a, like a non, you know, zero sum view and, and then like a very, very positive thing. That doesn't mean ETH or BTC or something is not a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. In fact, it, it means that crypto itself is, is extremely important. Those assets will be the thing that actually rises in price compared to stable units, right? You you want to, you know, actually be in this industry. Uh, I always say, for example, uh, I think stable coins are the third trillion dollar industry in crypto. So like I, I do genuinely think Bitcoin and Ethereum are the, the first two. And that, that's because they, they gave birth to the, the stablecoin industry, right? And so, like, um, I think that they live s symbiotically, right, uh, together. And so the thing is, that doesn't mean, though, that Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, 
are good at everything, right? They're they're good as investments, right? Uh, obviously, not investment advice. They're good as uh, as stores of value, and and uh, basically now with ETH being POS, it's actually interest bearing soon after Shanghai, essentially, right? Um, but I don't think people are gonna buy their coffee denominated in ETH. I think the collective consciousness of people thinking that uh, in like 2015, when I was kind of getting started in crypto, I think that's gone. No one, no one's saying like, uh, well, there's still some holdouts, but I think the writing is on the wall. Like the collective consciousness here is like, uh, no, you're not going to walk into like a coffee shop and, and see like, oh, like the double espresso is like 580 sats or something or whatever. Um, but but you'll be able to pay whether it's abstracted away or not. You'll be able to pay with a stable coin or you'll be able to pay with Bitcoin, but it's still denominated in dollars or whatever units. And then they'll switch it to stable coins in the back end, which is, again, the whole point that uh, stable coins will settle all of this stuff. Um, and so that's that's the stable coin maximalist view. And so my uh, idea here is like everything is kind of converging to issuing stable coins or people thinking about their their product as stable coins and so we've been doing that since 2019 since we we started thinking about it. so we've managed to be right on a on a few of these and and kind of essentially be able to predict the the direction of uh where things are going i think uh DeFi has trended towards like what you're referencing where every asset every asset that is not a stable coin looks to try to be a productive asset. And so if you can stake, if you can, uh, you know, provide liquidity, if you can lend it, if you can do all that ultimately and avoid having to spend it, you know, why, why would you do that and just go out instead and spend, you know, your, your stable coins. So I, I'm right with you. Like the, the future of you're going to spend, you know, sats on, coffee or or anything else any other sort of like unit other than a stable coin it just doesn't make any sense to me and i think what's really cool is that stable coins have demonstrated that when you remove the friction the friction to like understand an, a new unit of account uh to remove the friction of having to get accustomed to something that's more volatile people are more than happy then to to actually adopt that and start spending with stable coins it, it suddenly is seen as as more of a convenience. With over 60,000 subscribers and 450 integrations, Push Protocol, the leader in Web3 communications, just launched Push Group Chat. While Push Chat already enables secure and private wallet-to-wallet -wallet messaging between any wallet addresses, the new Push Group Chat allows anyone to permissionlessly create groups, share files, and collaborate with communities natively on Web3. Try it now at app.push.org. With over 170 million TVL cross-chain, the multi-chain liquid staking protocol Stator Labs is just about to launch the ETH liquid staking token ETHX. ETHX will give you the best of decentralized staking and DeFi yields. What's more is that anyone can permissionlessly run an ETHX node with just a 4 ETH bond. To get more alpha on the ETHX launch, go to statorlabs.com slash ethereum. Sam, something that I think I've heard you talking about on maybe another podcast was just this uh, nature of kind of positive sum mentality. And it kind of surprised me, to be honest, that as as opposed to kind of looking at some of these other stablecoin providers as competitors like USCC, DAI, whatever, you, you actually view it the opposite way, which is almost like counterintuitive to me. But um, I would just love for you to expand on that a little bit uh, and just kind of describe that in a little bit more detail. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think this is actually also kind of my life philosophy is just being positive some in, in everything, but not because it's nice or like, you know, it makes everyone feel good. I genuinely believe that it's it's like the, the, the right, both financial way to, to succeed, but also just obviously it is also nice. And what positive some means in the way that we always try to build and, and if, if Rax has known it for one thing I honestly would like it to be known as um, positive sum in, in terms of how we operate which is we're always trying to figure out how to create the most value rather than take it from people uh, and, and like take you know market share we're trying to figure out how to increase the size of the market and I think just like you're saying when you say it's kind of counterintuitive 
I hope that over time this this changes, at least in the crypto or DeFi industry, and is kind of exemplary to you know towards other industries as well, because you can create wealth unlike uh you know like people think it's like the laws of thermodynamics if i am to gain someone has to lose if if i if my share of the pie gets bigger i have to take someone else's uh piece of the pie that's not true that that that's true of like energy conservation and like physics right like that you can't create energy or, or destroy it but you can create wealth i mean human society has been getting wealthier and wealthier in terms of you know consumable items the average you know uh standard of living quality of life you can literally create wealth so that that's like the first realization of like uh you don't have to take from from someone else if you can figure out the proper way in which you and other market participants can actually create wealth uh that's always preferable and so like one thing that i always try to think about is for like frax the dollar peg stable coin or like frax ether which is uh an eth stable coin you know or people call it L and lsd how can we make sure that these stable coins are huge, you know, combined like trillions of dollars in, in market cap in, in the next five to 10 years, but we're not the only ones. Because for example, I would rather the Frax dollar peg stable coin be a trillion dollars of market cap and then USDC be like a trillion or two trillion or whatever of market cap rather than try to go and create a world in which the frac stablecoin is like three trillion dollars of market cap but like usdc is like 50 billion or it like fizzled out or it doesn't exist or something like that and the reason for that and i'm not just trying to say that to be like oh that, that we're, we're just so nice the reason for that is i genuinely think that if you're trying to build the the world where you know frax is a trillion you know usdc is a trillion you're far more likely to succeed than if you're trying to build the world where you've taken everything from everyone, you're far more likely to end up in the future. You're at the zero like market cap and then, you know, someone else is at the the three trillion or, or something like that. But if you're always striving genuinely to actually get to a point where you're increasing the the wealth in the market and, and, and letting that idea guide your design space, you're far more likely to succeed. Like, for example, and everything we, we build actually has this prevailing viewpoint for example we have the frax b fee system in curve which means like any stable coin no matter you know what your project is and, and things like that um if you pair with if you put your liquidity against the frax base pool which is a frax usdc uh curve pool you will get uh extra incentives and yield so you, you're because you're you're pairing with us you will uh get uh incentives that that basically trickle into all of the different meta pools of the the frax uh base pool system the reason we came up with that was because we thought, look, instead of, you know, going on Twitter and, and stuff and being like, uh, we're better than uh, like die or something. Die is like, you know, mean or stupid or like LUSD is like not cool or something. You know, there's a lot of these things on Twitter where if you read some of these people's like tweets, it always comes off as like weirdly, not just not like bitter, but like, like you were saying, uh, they think that in order to win, someone has to lose every part of their their like you know tweet or their marketing strategy or just even how they're trying to build their ecosystem is how can we take right? Uh, we're trying to do the exact opposite and genuinely think that if we can grow the market, we will be one of the biggest uh, you know people in that market. And so that's why we came up with stuff like this. So like any stable coin you know, uh, or, or just even any asset that pairs with Frax BP on curve gets extra incentives. And so we have over like 30 uh, plus pools, I think right now that are paired with Frax BP. We have, you know, we have LUSD, we have uh, uh, AlUSD, Alchemex USD, we have all of these, uh, we have BUSD and every single thing. And that's great. And, and so that's how you actually uh, lift other people up and like actually make the market larger and so frax obviously grows in that way if we you know had said oh like no no we, we don't want to do this frax bp thing that's just going to increase lusd's market cap that would be insane right like that that mindset would would keep us in irrelevancy right it would basically makes it makes us not useful for other people 
right other projects and and this is the exact opposite of, of being positive some in fact uh part of the thing we're exploring with frax ether the etherpeg stable coin you know slash lsd system is since it's a stable coin more than just an lsd we're exploring can we actually in the medium term back parts of the frax ether supply with things like uh, Steeth or Wreath, right? The Rocket Pool and Lido uh, LSD tokens. And and the reason for that is if you think of Frax Ether as like a, a stable coin, it would be kind of the same as kind of DAI backing itself partly with USDC or Paxos or something like that. Frax Ether can partly back itself with, with Steeth and Wreath. And the idea is that Frax Ether is the only kind of uh, Etherpeg stablecoin right now, right? Like everything else is, is structured as like a yield product, like rebasing or like uh, Reef is, is not pegged teeth. It's just always increasing in price. And so if we can be the kind of de facto ETH pegged stablecoin after Shanghai used in, in AMM pairs, used in all of these things, we can bring everyone up together as the Frax Ether kind of monetary premium everywhere, the spot demand for the this ETH pegged stablecoin uh, increases, we can actually back parts of Frax Ether with Steeth, with Wreath, and continue to help them grow. And they can actually see, okay, the more you know, monetary demand there is for this this ETH stablecoin, literally, it will suck up a lot of our LSD as backing onto their balance sheet, and it'll increase the amount of validators that we have, and and things like that. And so that's always been our our viewpoint. It hasn't been like how do we uh, how do we actually catch up to Lido and then overtake them? It's more like how can we continue to help Lido grow and then hopefully we also grow and and get up there. But we actually want to see, for example, Lido have 10 million you know staked ETH uh, rather than how can we get Lido from like four million or whatever they have to like one million so that you know Frax Ether can can have like a, a million staked ETH and then surpass them. Um, that's never been how uh we've ever thought we've never thought how do we uh you know take from other people and so if there's one thing uh ever that you know i, I kind of leave to the industry or like contribute to the industry other than the, the tech of like frax is that getting this counterintuitive uh view that you were talking about exactly is like you don't actually have to take from people you you can create wealth and so it's like it's not like the the laws of thermodynamics where it's like if for someone to to win another person has to lose we literally can all win human civilization has been winning the past like couple hundred of, of years on average right the wealth has been significantly growing over time so that's kind of my my view on it yeah i i love that answer and i think it's super refreshing just you know there's parts of defi that still exist now and probably forever will exist that are very PVP in nature, or at least there's a feeling of that. And yeah, just, just kind of everything you just outlined is, is, is just super refreshing. And I think, I think it makes sense. Like a lot of this stuff has been built to be composable and, you know, work, work with other, with other parts of DeFi to make all of DeFi stronger as a whole. Um, one, one thing you kind of alluded to was the, uh, Frax BP and just how you kind of like help kickstart or jumpstart some other stable coins. And I guess the way you do that, a big part of it is is something that the Frax team, I guess, had a lot of foresight to do way back when, when you started accruing all the convex, like in the world, essentially. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of want to just like dive in, like, like how, how did you have so much conviction in that? How did you have so much belief, I guess, in the Curve ecosystem that early on? To, to just do that and just kind of be in such a good position that you are in today to be able to do things like this with the somewhat control over the Curve ecosystem? Yeah. Um, so I think, uh, first of all, the the Curve team is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, Michael, uh, Mitch, Will, he goes by, and uh, the rest of the team. Uh, they're some of the smartest guys, I think, in, in, in the world, to be honest. And then also Convex, uh, those guys are some of the hardest working uh, and, and best developers uh, I've ever seen in, in the industry. Obviously, we didn't know that in, about Convex in, in 2021, around May, when, when they came out. Um, 
but I mean, now it's, it's pretty obvious, but again, it, it's, it goes back to kind of the, the view that, you know, now that we, we have all this stuff, how can we make sure it's the most beneficial to, to everyone rather than, uh, like, for example, we could have been like, okay, every stable coin, you know, you're screwed. Now we're just going to literally just, you know, adversarially vote for like the Frax, three CRV, and then like farm and then keep getting it. And then, but, but no, we're not doing that. Right. We're, we're basically giving it all to the, the ecosystem. Obviously it's good for Frax, right? I mean, again, I'm not saying it's just because we're nice. It's good for Frax. There's liquidity against Frax. It makes it more useful, but it also continues to create, uh, you know, positive sum innovation, people working on stable coins on their other thing. And they, they know that, you know, uh, the, the curve ecosystem is, is really exciting. They can get extra incentives. They can get all the, the CVX that we have channeled to them. In fact, it's almost like you're like, uh, you know, you guys control the curve ecosystem. It's almost like, I think it's good because if someone else controlled it, right, they, they could basically be like, uh, you all suck. We're just voting for, you know, our, our, our like fiat coin or whatever the thing and, and our stable coin. Good luck, you know, like bribing or incentivizing against us. You're never going to make it right, um, which we've never done. Uh, but back to the question of how did we have this foresight? You know, it's interesting. In my, in my view, um, there's this kind of different uh, outlook of the industry, which like there's like these uh, this orthodox view. And, and again, I'm not saying one is better than the other. Um, and, and by orthodox view, I mean kind of this, the, the maker, the Uniswap, the compound uh, guys. And, and, and like, uh, I'm not just saying it's, it's them and stuff, but the, the kind of OG old school DeFi people that, that kind of don't like the curve tokenomics. Like, uh, and, it's, it, and then the curve and then the VE tokenomics people and, and kind of the uh, other side of the, the non-orthodox I, kind of, uh, I don't want to give them like political names. I don't want to say the liberal DeFi people and the old conservative people and stuff. But I think you kind of get the the sort of kind of buckets that I'm trying to describe here is like the the people that are like tokens should just be like voting on like the the governance or like as grants and stuff if they do any kind of extra thing like you know like like kind of the Uniswap view or the MKR view right Maker the, its token doesn't do anything right it, it controls the votes and has you know kind of ownership of future profits or cash flow it does nothing else right and and i think a hallmark of the the other view is that you can actually build some kind of programmatic programmatic tokenomics whether they're good or bad you know it's outside of the scope of this specific you know episode but i think the main view is like no you can actually build utility into the you know the the ownership token the governance token whatever you like to call the equity like token which is a scary word for people right but you can build actual programmatic value and and utility into that and so i i always personally um whether you you like ve tokens or you don't i ascribe to the value that you can actually build uh utility into the the ownership token the governance token so that's why vefxs is a thing that's why we have a lot of really cool stuff planned for vefxs you know we have like we're researching how to do like lending boosts and, and ltv stuff for for frax lend and things like that but in terms of the foresight back to your question about how how that uh we got there we built this thing called the curve amo back in like early uh 2021 and for people that don't know frax kind of came up with this uh amo module idea which is uh, it stands for algorithmic market operations. And it's, it's really just uh, a smart contract that does just kind of a programmatic series of, of market operations, right? And you can like poke it or, or something and, and it just upkeeps some kind of operation. And the, and the curve AMO, what it does is it basically says, okay, uh, there's a Frax curve pool and it has some A factor. And basically, if, if it's above PEG, uh, which means there's less Frax tokens than the other side. Just mint Frax. Literally, you, you are the stablecoin issuer. Mint Frax into the curve pool, match it one-to-one -one so that it's exactly at peg. It's super simple, right? Um, and a lot of people got, got kind of confused by this because they're like, wait, if you just mint it in there, isn't, isn't that... Um, you know, isn't that like unbacked or whatever? It actually increases the CR. I explained this in the Empire podcast earlier uh, this week, so I don't want to kind of get into it, but... Um, it actually increases the CR by doing that. It's very uh, unintuitive. 
Um, and then the other direction, if, if everyone's selling their uh, frac stable coins into the curve pool so that the peg is below $1, right? Well, the AMO has all these LP tokens, right? That it's earning fees and yield on. And it can then take some of that out, take out fracs single-sided because everyone's selling fracs into the curve pool and then burn the fracs to, to re-peg the, the asset. So basically contract the supply of, of fracs uh, in the curve pool and, and re-peg. And so this actually, what this does effect, in, in effect is it makes the curve stable swap invariant the de facto mint redeem mechanism of the stablecoin protocol rather than like kind of hand coding like a, a PSM or just like a you know smart contract that's just like put your collateral in and get the other out. We we just saw a curve and we're like, look, this is the best way to do mint redeems for a stablecoin. Uh, it just needs like a market operation module. Everything going through this because it has small amounts of price discovery, so it's very efficient. Uh, it has a very very small amount of fee. So over time, you know, as volume increases with your stablecoin, it, it is a good money making. Uh, endeavor and also obviously Curve has really good yield CRV and then Convex after it came out. So our first main insight was that uh, Curve is the best place to have as your mint redeem mechanism. And so we built the Curve uh, AMO. And then the second kind of thing was kind of my view of uh, not being kind of an orthodox uh, you know view of of DeFi is that I really do like the um ve tokenomics now it's slightly separate than just ve tokenomics doesn't mean they're they're gauges or that gauges are really good and, and stuff but what i mean is locking your tokens in a non-transferable way so that on chain there is a lot of projects and people that are coordinated that they have a long-term interest in this thing that they can't just when when the when it's not trendy or something everyone just dumps spot their governance token and goes goes to the the next thing there's there's no on-chain coordination mechanism for kind of the orthodox og kind of governance tokens where you can come as an entity as a project as a DAO or anything and be like i am in this for two years i'm in this for four years i i'm gonna lock uh my you know governance token of like fxs or crv or something and i'm i'm here right i'm gonna be building here i am in it for the long haul obviously you get to have governance voices of course who else would have it other than people that are coordinating saying like i'm here for the long term and it's it's actually a really elegant way to get a lot of you know people across the world uh people that don't know each other projects that don't know how long term you are to actually have a distribution of tokens that is verifiably locked and so vfxs for example has a uh, average lock time of something I think like two years for like 55% of the the total circulating supply. So like over like half of all of the FXS that's circulating is actually locked for on average of, of two years. And so of course you, you have like a, a vibrant community of people building uh, a, a lot of you know stuff happening on Twitter and all these things. You have so many people coordinated and you know Convex is a huge project. There's other DAOs that have, have locked uh, VFXS saying that, look, uh, we're here for the long term. I think that's really valuable. I think that that's one thing people miss about VE uh, tokenomics. In fact, again, going back to a lot of stuff that's counterintuitive, I think the fact that it is not transferable is is very, very important because the thing that's of value is coordinating on chain that you are in it for, you know, whatever amount of time between like one to four years that that is uh you know your your amount of vesting right and that's what's important a lot of people miss this and they're like oh well we we're you know modifying our ve whatever so you can like transfer it it's like okay so then it's just like a weird differently named like mkr token or, or uni token right and so um that's the thing i i think it's one of those counterintuitive things i feel pretty strongly that it's a it's a good thing um and so far it's it seems pretty good to me Sam, I want to pull on this thread around uh, the, the positive sum strategies that you continually deploy. So I, I think we've we've uh, appropriately covered uh, one of the best examples, which was how you have you how you have used curve and convex emissions to grow fracs, but also to essentially grow 
the ecosystem of other stable coins alongside it. And and I think, again, the proof is in the pudding. It, it has very clearly benefited Frax, uh, but allowed you to be like a good ally to, to other stable coins out there. Another, uh, another like idea we heard you talk about more recently is that Frax could be potentially backed by Fed deposits. I'm wondering if you could like talk about like the strategy there, like how do you think about uh, basically going about the positive sum approach that you've taken? But in this case, you're you're now having to go off chain. So we we've seen what you can do with everything on chain and and these very composable sort of like money Legos. Uh, anything that you can share to sort of like break down like how to start to think about this and why it might ever be possible for Frax to be backed by Fed deposits. Yeah, definitely. Um, so obviously, I, I don't know the timeline. We are working on it uh, internally. I can say that, obviously. But I don't know because it's one of the few things is that we sh we ship really well. We ship great, uh, you know, stablecoin protocols and, and things like that. And we can control our destiny and, and timelines in smart contracts because we can do that. But this, I, I have no idea the, the uh, timeline. But I think it's important to talk about the reason um we've kind of arrived at this and the the reason is that i think in order to be the the most important stable coin it, you need to be the thing everyone you know flees to in a crisis no matter what the crisis whether it's like a liquidity uh crunch whether it's like a, a recession or like on-chain bear market whatever you want to call it and let's be honest right now in in like the greater DeFi ecosystem that's usdc Right, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, don't have any uh, shame in saying that it's not DAI, it's not Frax, it's, it's USDC, right? And uh, as evidenced, DAI and Frax have l large exposure. Frax through the Curve uh, AMOs, uh, the USDC liquidity that's owned by the protocol maker, by just a huge stash of USDC in their uh, PEG stability module. And lo and behold, Frax and DAI are the only things that haven't broken PEG because they've understood this, the system of you need to have a large amount of your backing as close to the risk-free thing as you can possibly find. And so the that's the first observation. And, and the second observation that's basically the conclusion of that is, okay, if we want Frax to be like that in the long term, we have to be like the the closest thing to the risk-free thing. We have to be like USDC in certain senses, different in, in other senses like we don't ever foresee the Frax dollar peg stablecoin having a blacklist. So like a lot of people ask, how is that even possible then? Um, hopefully we can kind of uh, explain that uh, later in terms of the, the structure once things get you know moving more. But the idea here is like, you need to be very, very close to the thing that you're pegging to, to the counterparty of the issuer being the only exposure that, that you have. So like, for Frax Ether, that's super easy. Frax Ether as a stablecoin should always be fully decentralized. It should never have any uh, off-chain like real-world assets or loans or anything because Ether is a completely decentralized asset, right? And the peg is Ether. The dollar is never going to be a decentralized asset and the Fed issues the dollar. And so if you want to be the most important dollar peg stablecoin, the closest thing, the risk-free thing, you have to be the closest thing to the Fed or the issuer of the dollar being your only counterparty. And so like, uh, I think on the Empire podcast or something, they, they were calling it uh, the one real world asset strategy. I actually think that that's a, a good way to put it is, I think stable coins that are trying to become the most important and the safest, they should have one real world asset, not like a hundred, right? And that one real world asset is whatever you can get as close to possible as uh, the Fed, you know, deposits or reverse repos, or if you can't get those, you know, the, the T-bill stuff that, that, you know, Paxos and uh, USDC currently have is, is good. In fact, USDC has gone one step further. They've created that money market fund with uh, BlackRock and BlackRock has access to the Fed's reverse repo facility. And what that means is the, the Fed is the only counterparty to that, to that money market fund. They, they, they sell all of the cash overnight to the Fed for, for reverse repo contracts. And the next day, the Fed buys it back. It's slightly above uh, the, the thing that 
Uh, they bought it last night, and so it creates this yield that's very close to the IORBs, the actual Fed funds rate for for deposits on on reserve balances. So, I think that's correct. That it's not a coincidence why USDC is the closest thing to risk free, and we want to make sure that that's what Frax is. It's not the the riskiest stable coin. It's not the it's not the you know thing that everyone you know would would flee to or like it's it's not a small mcap stable that like in a huge you know market uh dump or chaos or liquidity event like issue uh everyone dumps it for for the thing that has the most liquidity that's what we want to make sure frax is uh at the top right and so the way to do that and and again i i know there's probably a lot of people that will listen to this that disagree and they're like oh you know now the government can knock on your door one day and be like hey you know that uh, account you have at the Fed or the reverse repo facility or whatever, uh, yeah, you know, we, we that, that, that's gone. And then, the, you know, they worry, oh my God, then like the price of this stable coin will go straight to zero or DPEG or something. Those are very legitimate concerns. I don't want to discount those concerns. But what I want to highlight is that I think that the writing is on the wall unless people give different empirical evidence that at scale, if you peg your stablecoin to the US dollar or any sovereign currency, you cannot escape the fact that you will at least have one counterparty risk, the issuer of that currency that you're pegging to. You, th there's no empirical evidence that, that you can scale in a decentralized way. Uh, all the decentralized stablecoins are basically micro cap stablecoins compared to uh, USDC or even they're, they're like a fraction of fraction of like frax and, and die even, right? Um, and so unless there's empirical evidence, I'm pretty confident to say like if you peg to a national currency, you're not going to be able to, you know, uh, have de decentralization, whether it's, you know, real or, or kind of, you know, this kind of quasi decentralization and be able to escape essentially the counterparty risk or the custodial risk of the sovereign nation that issues the stable coin, uh, the, the currency the, the, of the stable coin that you're paying to. Yeah. That is such a like fun rabbit hole to go down. I, I honestly have never thought about it that way. It makes total sense. I think it's very like, it's a very like sobering view that, you know, for all the USD pegged stable coins, uh, no matter how quote unquote, uh, decentralized they are at the end of the day, we're, we're dependent upon you know, those US dollars and what the value they um what value they hold according to the Fed and so on. Yeah, the the fi the the final thought on, on that topic though is like that's why we have the Frax price index. That's why we have Frax Ether and, and things like that, which is not pegged to a sovereign uh country's, you know, unit of account. And so FPI should in theory be uh entirely possible to be uh, on chain and decentralized frax ether for sure should be uh, always decentralized and, and have no custodial risk uh, off chain right and so we understand that so like that's why fpi is the, the first stable coin that's pegged to the cpi and basket of consumer items you can uh you know there will be governance on chain for that there's no reason that needs to have you know uh, like like a fed uh, deposit account or, or anything like that, and obviously not for Axe Ether. So the the rule is just basically about national currency uh, stable coins. Makes sense. Sam, one of your like newest products that we haven't had a chance to talk more extensively about yet is uh, FRX ETH or Frax ETH. Can you talk about why it is again? It's a stable coin. I think it's uh, appropriately labeled a stable coin that is uh, pegged to ETH versus an LSD, and then maybe a bit more about what you mentioned earlier, uh, how you could pot potentially have it backed by other LSDs, such as Steph or RETH, uh, which sort of plays into the whole sort of positive sum theme that you've talked about. Yeah, definitely. So um, the way that we think about uh, Frax Ether, FRX ETH, is that it is like a stablecoin and that the POS yield that you know our validators get currently, the, the team runs them, but it's going to be distributed after Shanghai. Anyone can spin it up. Uh, is that the POS yield is kind of like the risk-free yield. Whatever the, the Ethereum protocol or closest to risk-free yield, I, I understand that there's still some uh, risk of, of running an honest validator still, but 
it's the closest thing to basically the interest bearing rate that the issuer of ETH, which is the the Ethereum protocol, the Ethereum blockchain actually gives out, right? So what we think is we essentially have Frax ETH, which is a stable coin. That's why it can be backed by, you know, uh, other LSDs where we don't say Frax Ether is an LSD protocol. So, you know, all of it is always forever going to be backed by uh, Frax run or Frax community run validators. Uh, that's the first thing is it opens up the design space a lot and allows us to back it with other things like Steeth, like Wreath. And I don't think, for example, unless Lido starts thinking about Steeth as like a uh, stable coin, they're not going to back uh, Steeth with like Wreath or, or Frax Ether and, and things like that. But we can't because that's in, in our design space. And that's why we always call it uh, an ETH stable coin rather than uh, an, an LSD. And so we think about the structure of Frax Ether the same way we think about all kind of stablecoin structure like like the the dollar, like the Frax dollar pegged stablecoin. There's a risk-free rate that the issuer provides, right? For dollars, it's the FET rate. Uh, for ETH, it's the POS uh, rate that, that's basically run uh, for when the validators get. That we have access to, right? And so you build a kind of yield curve between the stablecoin, the thing that gets zero percent interest for you just holding it idle right and and staked frax ether which is that volt token that you can go and stake in the pos vault that gets all of that uh risk-free essentially yield risk-free within the system i always want to put it next to like an asterisk because it's uh it's the least risky thing in the system not literally in the entire uh world obviously um and so when you modulate the yield curve between Frax Ether, the stablecoin, and kind of this other token that has the uh, risk-free interest rate, then you can actually, you know, slightly move some interest over to the Frax Ether stablecoin in AMM pairs, in other places, people that pair with with this uh, currency, right? This this new stablecoin, and uh, get people to actually create liquidity, get people to actually use it uh, in place of other things. And uh, people can either put it in the risk-free uh, POS vault or they can uh, do all of these things. And our, our growth model is that as this thing grows, as the monetary premium of Frax Ether grows, we can back it with uh, other LSDs. And so that actually increases the uh, demand for other LSDs. Uh, we haven't done like a governance vote or things like that yet because it's so early, but like the you know initial kind of assets uh, and their composition, like like Steeth and, and Wreath and stuff, uh, can be voted on in governance. And I, you know, we plan to do that in, in the medium term for sure. That That's super exciting. Uh, look, looking forward to seeing that play out. Uh, Sam, we're kind of conscious of your time. Don't want to keep you too much longer. We got a couple more questions, but I just wanted you to fast forward three to five years and just kind of describe what you think the Frax ecosystem looks like. And then like what you would consider a resounding success to look like and maybe you already feel that yeah uh well i i don't think we're, we're ever done so i don't think there's ever uh a resounding success because we're always building towards uh the the next thing and so um i think if you ask for example you know come back here next year january tw or february now 2024 um and you say um what would you want to have accomplished it's Basically, we want Frax, the dollar peg stablecoin, to be multi-billion in, in market cap uh, and, and increase that from, from the around one billion that it is right now. We want Frax Ether to be multi-billion uh, market cap. And we want FPI to obviously grow into the hundreds of millions, hopefully into uh, above one billion. We also... Uh, have a few kind of stealth things that we're working on, which is, uh, we'll call it the, the BAM, which is the Borrow AMM, which is a very uh, very stealth thing where we haven't really talked about a lot, but I think it's kind of a, a zero to one innovation. There's really nothing like it in, in DeFi. Um, and we want to release that by, you know, February 2024 for sure. And uh, there's a lot of people that are very active in the community know that there's like a little bit of, of rumblings of Frax Chain, which is kind of a uh, modular rollup that we're doing preliminary research is very, very far out. So I, I don't think by February 2024, it will be anywhere close to being out, but 
people will definitely know about it for sure. And there'll probably be a release date for, for that. So uh, by next year, uh, and it will be very interesting because again, like I said at the beginning uh, of this conversation, nothing we build is quite like anything that, that's ever kind of existed. And we don't fork stuff. We don't like just, you know, fork it and, and like rebrand it or something. So uh, if you think about why Frax uh, could need a chain or even wants a chain or kind of wants a hybrid roll up stuff, that's a conversation that could potentially be a whole uh, another episode. But if you think about it, what would a stable coin centric roll up uh, and, and kind of modular blockchain like Celestia even look like, for example, um, that's where we're headed with, uh, with Frax chain, but it's so early that it's, you know, I usually like to, uh, do rather than, you know, speak or hype about stuff. Hey Sam, what about Frax ETH as a replacement for, for ETH? This is something else, uh, I, we heard you speak about recently and it, it had me thinking like, that's just an enormous enormous market if you can penetrate that like if if we can think more about folks holding uh a form of well basically a pegged form of eth that very easily of course can start to earn yield if you stake it and now now you've got the staked fraxed eth uh but you've you've got all sorts of other like strategies out there with curve and convex i'm sure that are 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 yet to release so um, yeah, anything else you can share, elaborate on around this like FRX ETH replacing Weath? Yeah, so we call it the the Weather or Weather Weath replacement program. And so it's a pretty lofty thing. So a lot of people are like, oh, you know, wow, like uh, this is never going to happen or, or work or something. But I think it's n- not too uh, crazy. I think actually, for example, after Shanghai, there's basically... Uh, all of the current LSDs will have very, very good pegs, right? Like, because other than the withdrawal queue time variability, you can always just withdraw one to one ETH and then get it out. And so the next stage of like evolution of what all of these projects, whether it's Lido or Rocket Pool or Frax Ether, um, what everyone's going to be thinking about, going back to kind of this view of everyone will think like stable coins, is like they're going to want to accrue monetary premium. And so again, what that means is they're going to want to create spot demand for their uh, LSD and hopefully make it look more like a stable coin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have the the strategy for that right out of the gate, right? Which is this, this uh, WEATH replacement program. And so the idea is if you replace uh, WEATH, if you have like a pair in an AMM or like anything that your governance token is, is paired to uh, ETH and you want to replace it with Frax ETH, you will get uh, proportional incentives for doing that. And so everywhere that if you're a project that has uh, an ETH trading pair on an AMM or you know it's in your DAP, whatever the DAP might be, um, if you replace it with Frax ETH so that you have you know the incentivized pair is Frax ETH, we will give you... Uh, proportional incentives uh, in this uh, with replacement program. And I think this is pretty cool because it will be very close to to, to with after withdrawals are open because everyone can just withdraw. Obviously, it's not exactly the same thing, right? Like you can't use Frax Ether for paying for gas um, and things like that. But we have ways, which I think will have basically more than enough uh, extremely deep curve liquidity to always do inline swaps for for like paying for gas uh people that want to do large withdrawals there will be huge uh natural arbors coming in right to arb that that like just even tiny if it's like 0.99 you know 95 eth to frax eth they know that it's going to perfectly be at 1.000 soon after the withdrawal queue and and things like that right and so I think once the market efficiency sets in with that, it is a very legitimate thing to do. And uh, going back to the kind of positive sum view, we're already working on this stuff and our expertise is monetary premium, stable coins and, and building spot demand. Lido and Rocket Pool's you know, expertise is you know, validators being a uh, yield bearing LSD structure. If they continue to do that really well and we continue to do this really well, 
like I was saying, we can just back a significant portion of the frac ether uh, supply with Steeth and Wreath, and, and they continue to do this. Well, the more monetary premium that frac ether gets, the, the larger the demand for Steeth and Wreath, and everyone wins, right? It's, it's not, uh, you know, come use frac ether and like we're, you know, we're, you know, enemies with, with every other project or, or LSD. And so uh, this kind of adversarial environment is exactly the, the thing we're not going to do, right? We want to think about how we can turn the monetary premium that we get into uh, demand for Steeth and Wreath as well. And, and other LSDs, if they can be as safe and, and, and good as uh, Rocket Pool and Lido, which are obviously the current industry leaders. Yeah, it's a no-brainer to to want to partner with Frax, given this sort of philosophy. Uh, I know Adam and I work with the Stater Labs team, and they're going to be launching an ETH LSD. Perfect example, as you're trying to build liquidity, to think, how can I partner up with the Frax ecosystem? Like, how how can how can we work together in this sort of positive sum manner? But um, Sam, on that note, I think this is probably a great place for us to to uh, quit for today. Uh, this was a total pleasure, you know, no surprise to to get to sort of pick your brain. Uh, I, I, truthfully, I'm sort of blown away by there's just so many thoughts you have that are not commonly held truths in DeFi. And as DeFi dad, it kind of just blows my mind, like how... Like, yeah, just how many sort of like novel points I, I, I think you covered today. So I feel like I'm gonna have to play this conversation back over and over again, just to try to like consume all of this. And so just thank you for that. Like, it's hard to have really novel conversations um, in the space. And and then of course, most importantly, we want to remind everyone they should go to frax.finance to learn more about frax. A, a great resource is facts.frax.finance all sorts of like fantastic metrics to dig into like what's happening on chain and basically the state and health of all these different products and how many folks are using them and then another great tool is uh frax.convexfinance.com that's where all these different sorts of uh vaults exist you know which allow someone to be a curve lp and then ultimately boost those earnings uh, through Convex and and, and other um, rewards. Um, that's not a recommendation or endorsement to invest, but you get the point how DeFi works. So uh, Sam, if someone wants to get in touch with you or follow your work and, and Frax, um, where would you recommend they they follow you? Yeah, so Frax is on uh, Twitter and Telegram all the time. We do also have a Discord. I'm a little bit more on uh, Telegram much more, but it's at Frax Finance on Twitter and at Frax Finance on uh, Telegram. Same thing with me. It's just my name, Sam Kazmian, on uh, Twitter and also on Telegram. And uh, as always, it's been a pleasure, and it's always great to talk to you guys. Absolutely, man. Congrats on all your on all your success. It's just kind of mind blowing. We just came out of the well. Hopefully, we came out of a bear market and. Uh, I feel like Frax has only grown. It, it doesn't feel like you, you all have taken the hits uh, in the same sort of manner. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. If you're a talented builder like Sam, please consider reaching out to our team at fourthrevolution.capital. And for links to subscribe, listen, and watch the Edge podcast, visit the Edge podcast link tree at linktr.ee slash edge underscore pod.